Look at this beautiful forest. It seems like a green blanket covering the mountains. And it looks smooth and homogeneous. We see here the northern coastal temperate rainforest of Alaska and British Columbia, which is the world's largest contiguous coastal temperate rainforest. Many of the world's largest and tallest tree species are found in this ecoregion. The first survey to systematically explore the forest canopy in Vancouver Island's forest yielded 15,000 new species, a third of all invertebrates known to exist in all of Canada. Among the collection were 500 species previously unknown to science. These forests have some of the largest concentration of grizzly bears globally, mainly due to the region-rich salmon streams. Indeed, the rivers of the rainforest of Alaska and British Columbia are full of returning Pacific salmon. The Pacific salmon return to spawn and die in its birthplace. From dying salmon, the mighty forests grow. These expensive lush forests of the Pacific Northwest are nourished by the annual fertilizer boost provided by the migrating salmon. So we learn that the beautiful, seemingly homogeneous forests have evolved through ages by integrating many different plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, and viruses to become what we perceive from far away as one entity, a green blanket covering the feet of the mountains. 10,000 years ago, humans walked out of the balanced nature and habitat where they lived as hunters and gatherers and pioneered agriculture. The birth of agriculture also, the birth of the monoculture of plants and animals. It became an industry. The monoculture of wheat, rice, corn, and other stipled crops has enabled humans to grow in numbers quickly. But at the same time, many other problems start rising. Both the agriculture and the industrial revolutions had significant effect on humans' life and on nature. By growing huge monoculture fields, we allowed specialized pests to devour our crops. Then man invented machinery and toxic chemicals to fight its own wrongdoing. Look at this beautiful green blanket covering the sea. The axis of nitrogen and phosphorus molecules cause an overgrowth of algae in short period, and we can then call them algae blooms. The overgrowth of algae consumes oxygen and blocks the sunlight from underwater plants. When the algae eventually dies, the oxygen in the water is consumed, and the lack of oxygen makes it impossible for aquatic life to survive. The largest dead zone in the United States, about the size of New Jersey, is in the Gulf of Mexico and occurs every summer due to nutrient pollution from the Mississippi River Basin. Marine and fresh water of the United States are increasingly impacted by harmful algae blooms, with blooms reported in nearly every state. They caused annual economic losses of about $100 million. In early November 2021, I received an email from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, announcing a request for proposal of $15 million in funding for harmful algae bloom, research projects throughout U.S. coastal and Great Lakes waters. On September 17, 2020, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, offered over $6 million in funding to research to find ways to control and prevent harmful algae blooms. In physical years, 20 19 through 2021, Congress provided the United States Geological Survey, USGS, with additional resources to assess harmful algae blooms. The U.S. is currently funding 24 projects in 15 geographic area that advance real-time monitoring, remote sensing, and the use of molecular techniques to identify and predict the occurrence of the harmful algae blooms and the toxins they produce. What is the reason for the harmful algae blooms? Today, approximately 3 billion people, about half of the world's population, live within 
200 kilometers of the coastline. Worldwide sewage is the largest source of environmental contamination and discharges have increased dramatically in the past three decades. 80% of marine pollution comes from land-based sources. The remaining 20% comes from acid rain and oil spills. So how can we produce healthy food while keeping the balance, avoiding environmental pollutions? When I've served as the Aquaculture Program Coordinator of the University of Hawaii, I had the opportunity to meet some of the Pacific Islanders who were concerned with food security. Since over 90% of Pacific Islands food supply is imported, they asked the troubling question, what will happen to us all when the ship stops coming to the island? Upon the arrival of explorers, missionaries, businessmen, and with the spread of colonialism, Add to it the introduction of new diseases, exotic plants, animals, and pest, and monoculture agriculture, such as the sugarcane industry, the fragile natural balance of the sustainable food production system has been broken. The majority of the flora and fauna became a danger, and the islanders were exposed to diseases non-healthy food and drugs, which decimated the native human population. In the past, the Pacific Islanders knew how to take care of the food supply and live a balanced life with nature. I found out that sustainability isn't a new idea in old Hawaii. Sustainability was the Hawaiian way of living. They lived healthy life using the natural resources, wisely by creating a strict system for growing food by regulating water use and water quality. For example, Oahu was divided into sections like a pie from mountain to the sea. And each piece is called Ahupua. I found out that the concept of the Hawaiian Ahupua included community-based sustainability. All people who live in the Ahupo'a can access resources from the mountain to the sea. Management system that relies on integration rather than on fragmentation. Ahupo'a is based on Pono. Among other valuable traits, Pono has the concept that whenever an islander took anything from the land or sea, something needed to be replaced. In an Ahupu'a, the mountains region was used for hunting. The midsection that was rich with water was used for growing taro, or kalo in Hawaiian. The fish was supplied either by fishing or in fish ponds on the seashores of the Ahupu'a where the fresh water from the springs met the salty ocean water. Therefore, in 2009, Realizing the need for food security in the Pacific Islands, taking into consideration the vastness of the Pacific Ocean and the spread of the many islands, I was looking for an aquaculture concept that will serve as the base for an educational program that can feed everyone, everywhere. After some research and discussion with the local communities, we chose an integrating food production model called aquaponics. Aquaponics negates the monoculture that became the standard with the birth of the agricultural and industrial revolution. It does so by integrating multiple and interdependent organisms to produce food while recycling the water. Aquaponics is an integrated aquaculture system where fish are fed pellets. Nitrifying bacteria break down the dissolved waste that carries toxic components with nitrogen and phosphorus into nitrites and nitrates, which the plant utilizes as nutrients. The water is then recirculated back to the fish.
The roots and plants absorb those minerals to produce vegetables. The plants clean the water from harmful molecules and the water flow back into the fish, which reuse the clear water. This way, we can enjoy balanced meals with protein from the fish and healthy vegetables and fruits, which supply the needed minerals, vitamins, and fiber to our diet. The advantage, we realize, was the flexibility of this system, where one can build it as do-it-yourself with minimal cost and with the participation of family and community members or build a commercial size operation that supplies fish and vegetables to supermarkets. With the support from the Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Education of the University of Hawaii at Manoa and grants from NOAA, we started the project. My team included a music professor, Barbara McLean, a farmer and his farm manager, Glenn Martinez and Natalie Cash, and a few students. Together, we were able to build a hybrid program, both online and hands-on, that taught aquaponics in the islands, local communities. We were able to introduce the aquaculture training online learning program and teach farmers, high school students, and community members, including local women organizations throughout the Pacific in Hawaii, American Samoa, Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Northern Mariana Islands, Guam, Palau, and the Philippines. For example, on Rota, an island in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, five workers completed the hands-on ATOL project and opened a center for aquaponics training. They constructed in Rota three different types of aquaponics models and taught, per the mayor's request, every farmer and high school students on the island. By 2013, at least five commercial scale aquaponics farms were started in Hawaii, growing a variety of vegetables and fish. The most viable products were leathers and tilapia, which favor Hawaii's mild tropical weather and are therefore traded in the supermarkets year round. In 2020, the global aquaponics market size is valued at $580 to $630 million. The monoculture concept entered also the marine and offshore aquaculture. Big cages with only one species, usually carnivorous fish such as salmon, sablefish in the temperate zone, and cobia and sea bass and sea bream in the tropical and subtropical zones. Fish are way more efficient growers than any farmed animal because they don't need to resist gravity in the water. They don't need to invest energy to regulate the body temperature. The problem is that the fish excrete about 70% of the nitrogen from the rich protein diet that they eat to the surrounding environment. These marine fin fish grow in high density while the waste is being poured through the cages into the surrounding water with the thought that dilution is the solution. So how not use monoculture in offshore aquaculture? The answer is IMTA. Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture, or IMTA, is a scientific way to say polyculture. It involves the culture of different species alongside each other, but not just randomly chosen. Each species has its unique ability and plays an important role. The IMTA concept relies on several trophic levels, starting with the feeder species, the marine fin fish, which excrete nitrogen and phosphorus into the surrounding. To get rid of the nitrogen and the phosphorus, we need to grow in the same environment, extractive inorganic feeders, such as macroalgae. A good example is kelp, which can be used for biomass, carbon sequencing, animal feed, and more. Adding filter feed organisms, such as mussel and scallops, will clean the organic matters that comes, oozes out of the cages. And last but not least, 
it is essential to add deposit feeder such as sea cucumbers, sea urchins, and sea worms, which usually feed on the leftovers at the bottom of the ocean. By converting inorganic and organic molecules and waste particles into sustainable growth of plants, shellfish, and benthic species added to the finfish, we can produce a better balanced ecosystem while providing additional income to the diversified crops for the farmers. This way, we are mimicking the recycling in the rainforest and nothing goes to waste while maintaining the cycle of life. From the endless universe, with its numerous stars, to the humble atom, with its revolving particles, balance is kept by integrating matters. We, who evolve from stardust, must keep our actions in tune with nature and stop creating disastrous disturbances that threaten the existence of our future generations. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts with you.